Hey everyone, I'm here with uh, with Matt. I'm, we're down in Pensacola here, actually recording here in a hotel room to, uh, to get you your Q&A questions uh, for the group that Matt runs. The first question everyone right now is probably wondering is if I drove down all the way to Pensacola yeah. for a Q&A video, which is no. Um, I, I did go out of the, my path a little bit, uh, headed down to Charleston, but Matt is the owner of History Candles Company, as well as runs the Problin 600, MB100, and Joy Wax Facebook group. Yep. So that being said, if you're not familiar with who Matt is, let him introduce himself. Well, again, my name is Matt Bauman, and uh, I'm the owner of History Candles. Um, and I started this ProBlend Pro Blend 600 group um, basically because that's what I was using for my candles, and there was nothing out there. So I went ahead and put something out there, and I just started building more and more momentum. Um, and there's a lot of questions that, that people ask and people have that are very common and similar. So we thought we'd put a video together to answer some common questions that you have. So the first question um, I'm going to throw out to Wade. And if you've watched his other videos, you already know this. But basically, what process do you use uh, as far as temperatures, heating temperatures, adding fragrance oil, color, any additives, and pour temperature? So I think with most things candle related, you got to break it down into two chunks. So it depends on if you're making small batches or large batches. Um, and if you're curious as to why, it's because if you're doing large scale batches or manufacturing of any kind, um, you, you, you have a more detailed process and things become a little bit more efficient. For example, anyone that's seen my video of using that Cougar pumper machine, uh, temperatures really don't matter so much in that thing. It, it mixes everything by gram by gram with fragrance and wax. So you have, it, it's just different, it's a different process. And if you're doing large scale manufacturing, you're in a, you could be in a warehouse, you could be in a, a more climate controlled location. All of those things matter. So it does depend on the size of batch you're making. But I'm gonna assume that for the most part, everyone's making small batches, a couple candles at a time, maybe a, a case at a time, something like that. In that regard, my simple process for ProBlend 600 is to heat it up. And again, I think there's an acceptable range. I think it's pretty flexible for giving wax. So I would melt it or, you know, melt the wax up way up to 200 is usually fine. Uh, most people are going to tell you somewhere in the range of about 185. If you're using any additives like UV inhibitor, Vibar, and even dye, I would tend to add those sooner. When the wax is hotter, it's just going to incorporate a lot easier for you. You want to make sure those things get really dispersed throughout the blend. Um, and then fragrance oil, again, this is going to depend on your how many you're making and the reason i say that is you don't want your wax to cool too quickly when you're adding your fragrance oil and so if you're working with a small pouring pot and you've only got a pound or two of wax in there and you add that fragrance oil, it's going to drop pretty quick and so if that's the case i would add your fragrance a, a little hotter so i would be adding your fragrance at you know the 175 180 185 because it's going to drop your temperature your wax pretty quickly if you're making a larger wax, a four pound pot, or you're doing something even larger than that, adding the fragrance oil in is not gonna cool the wax that, that quickly. So you have a lot more time to stir, a lot more time to incorporate everything together. The most important part about this wax, in my opinion, because it is forgiving on what temp you melt it to and what temp you, uh, you add the fragrance. To me, the most important part of this wax is the pour temp. The lower temperature you can pour your candles and get away with it, meaning it's gotta still be able to pour. Uh, you don't want things that are instantly cooling. You don't want it to get so thick that it's hard to pour into the pouring pot. You don't want to be pouring it like 120 degrees, for example. But the lower you can pour and get away with it, the better. You'll get smoother tops, you'll get less shrinkage, you'll get less issues on the top. So I would say for most people, if you can pour anywhere between 140 and 165, somewhere in there, it depends on your jar too. Yeah. Certain jars hold heat better and will slow you know, slowly cool better. Certain jars that are wider than they are tall, tend to have less problems. That is a super complicated answer probably. <laughs> that, that wasn't simple at all. So, and the reason for me is because I do all these variations in different batch sizes. Yeah. So maybe, maybe Matt, if you can say, in, when you're making your candles, what size of batches you're typically making and which in those ranges do you typically pour? That might so, be easier. Yeah, so I do batches of eight and, and you know sometimes it's four. Like if it's a if it's a um, candle that I don't sell a whole lot of, but I've got to have some stock, I'll just make four of them. So, you know, I run into um, 
heating or, or cooling too fast when I'm making the four versus the eight. Yep. So I usually heat up to 200 degrees. Yep. I just want to have time and it doesn't hurt it. I can go up to 205. It doesn't hurt a thing with the I sweats. Hurt anything. Yeah. Um, because I like to add my fragrance oil like right around 185 pretty much every time. Yep. Um, that's by the way, not to cut you off. That's the, that's what I would do for anyone starting with almost any wax. Yep. Just, it's the easiest thing to, to, to remember to do. Most ma wax manufacturers are going to recommend that to you. Get comfortable doing that. You can't really go wrong with that. And then as you become more experienced, you can start adjusting based off of what's happening specifically with you and your conditions that you're pouring in. But that's a perfect place to start. Yeah. So yeah, 185. Now I, you get a lot of questions on how long do you stir this stuff? And, and I picture it like I've heard it in your video. It's Picture a, a cup of coffee and you add the creamer. Yeah. Stir until it's done. Yeah. Um, so you can you can overdo it at two minutes. It's not going to hurt a thing, but you don't have to do it for two minutes with this wax. You really don't. No. That, that's more. Yeah. That two minute thing is is it's more of a just a, a kind of a rule of thumb guidance that someone said years ago, and it's just right. kind of stuck. You just need to stir it until it's blended. You, you, just, you know, once the point that it's fully dispersed and blended, more stirring isn't going to change anything. Fragrance oil is designed to be added to wax. Wax is designed to hold a certain amount of fragrance oil, meaning it's going to mix together easily on its own. I mean, that's how it works. Now, the lower you you are, the lower temperatures you're working with can require you to need to stir a little bit more, um, just because you want to be sure that you know everything's getting blended together. When you're adding it somewhere around 185, this is why people recommend it. It's going to blend very quickly. I mean, honestly, it's blending in a matter of seconds, but you, you just don't need to stir more than 30 seconds. You really don't. Yeah. It's unnecessary. Yeah. And in fact, there's actually a problem with stirring. Well, not so much for stirring too long, but I think a bigger problem is how quickly I see people stirring. I'll see people in there just whipping that stuff right. really quick. Yep. You're introducing so much air into your wax, even if you don't see it. You're introducing a lot of air by doing that. And that, that, those air molecules can get trapped in there as well. And then, so people that deal with like funny looking surfaces or sinkholes and air bubbles, excessive air bubbles, that kind of stuff, that's just from stirring too fast. So stir nice and slow, pour your candles slowly. Yep, yep, agreed. And I, and I run into the same thing as far as um, pouring. I usually try to pour about 140. Yeah. It, when I start to see just a little bit of cloud, it's time for me to pour. And I try to get it down there because otherwise, you do run into issues. If you don't have enough candles kind of packed tight together when you pour so they keep each other nice and warm, you're going to get the dips. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good tip because like I said in the beginning, I like to pour as low as possible. If you go to anywhere anywhere you buy this wax, even the manufacturer of, the, of these waxes will tell you, oh, we pour somewhere around 165. That's just kind of the general rule. And that will work in some conditions and it will work with certain jars. But the lower you can pour this, you're going to get much smoother tops and results. Yep. Now you might be wondering, and I'm curious your thoughts on this. You might be wondering, well, is that going to impact jar adhesion? Mm -hmm. All right. I've got several ways to answer this. My first one would be, don't worry about jar adhesion. Like I know everyone loves to, to aim for it and to see it, but you can only control it for so long. As soon as they leave your hands and sit on a shelf or yep. uh, get boxed up or sent to a customer, you have no control over it. If a wax is going to shrink or pull away at some point, it's going to happen. You can make it look perfect, but it's probably just going to come back later. A lot of waxes like ProBlend 600 that are single pour waxes are designed to have minimal shrinkage. The problem with minimal shrinkage is it's arguably worse than all 100% shrinkage. Right. And that's why if you make a lot of candles, one side of your jar looks perfect and the other jar looks not. It's because it's cooling kind of unevenly. And so that's a long-winded answer to saying I wouldn't worry too much about trying to control jar, jar adhesion. But more importantly, pouring at a lower temperature can actually help that issue anyways, um, especially if you're someone that's pouring in a nice controlled temperature environment. Because the cooler you pour, the less the wax is going to shrink as it hardens. It's shrinking in the pot. Yes, it's shrinking more before you pour the candle. As, as everyone knows, you know, wax expands everything pretty much, expands as it heats up, shrinks as it cools. Well, if you narrow the gap between your pour temp and the uh, so solid temp of that wax, it's less time for it to shrink. So you can actually help that problem. Not to mention, which is actually why the top of your candle when you pour cooler is much flatter. 
and you have less dips around the wick. If you're getting a lot of dips around the wick like this at the top of your candle, try pouring cooler. Yep, and watch the ambient temperature. I try to keep my pour temperature, I try to keep it like 75, 76 degrees. That's probably more hot than people would use, or usually do, but um, it, it does help keep the, the tops does. nice and smooth. Yep. So that was a super long answer to the first question, but the first question was very yeah. wide, wide open. It's the basics, and it, you know, if you're just starting out using this wax, this that's the process that we use. Yeah, yeah, and actually, let's simplify it real quick because I threw out a lot of extra information that I realized after I was going too long. If you're starting with this wax brand new, any of these waxes, I would say heat to 185 to 200. Add your friggin' soil between, I'll say 175 and 185, somewhere in that range. Pour your candles as cool as you can. Try to get as close to 140 as possible, yep. and then adjust. Adjust from there. And you know, if you if you read what the manufacturer is going to tell you, whether you're looking at the Flaming Candle website or whatever you're looking at, it, it, what he just said is not what it's going to tell you. Right. But this is just based on experience. And a lot of what I'm telling you is from working with the manufacturer, the wax directly. There you go. The suppliers are going to give you ranges that are good, solid ranges. And it's not its not that they're wrong at all. And they're the safest answer is yeah. what I'm saying. Right. It's more about experience and learning from others, like what we're doing right now, that'll help you kind of fine tune and dial in to get better results. Yep. So, but yep. it all comes down to your own testing as well. So Jen asks, would you recommend these waxes for candle scent or pouring bar? So mm, I can kind oh. of take that one. Uh, no, I wouldn't recommend it. I mean, you can do it, you can use it, but essentially wax melts is what she's asking. Oh, okay. So oh, no, 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 I'm sorry. Candle center porn bar. I was thinking they meant one of those candle... Well, I'm not entirely sure what they mean. It, it could be. If you meant wax melts... They, no. No, because it, it, it's too soft and it'll stick to the clamshell. Um, but if you're... If the, and if that's what you meant, and you want to look for a similar wax to ProBlend 600 or whatever, then look at ProBlend 650, Joy Wax, or MB 150. 150. Those would be the three that are better for wax melts. If that's not what you meant, and you're really asking about, I'm thinking she meant maybe a candle bar. A candle scent bar, I think you're right. Which, if that's the case, sure, I don't think it really matters. Um, if, if anyone's curious what a candle bar is, it's where, uh, it's like a storefront where people can come in, choose their scent, and make a candle right there in-house, in and then they get to take it with them. The problem with those is they don't have time to cool. And so you got two options. Go with the wax, it cools much, much, much faster, which could be most paraffins or even GI 6006, or let them come pick it up the next day or a couple days later. Yep. So as far as, yeah, I'm not entirely sure what, what the question was, but hopefully we answered one of them. Yeah, it, I mean, it's a very forgiving wax, very easy to work with. So oh, as yeah. far as, um, you know, if, if you have fragrance oils, you can pretty much, um, do all the testing and know, okay, these fragrance oils are going to work with these wicks. So if you're doing that type of thing, yep. it's, a, it's pretty easy to do. Where do you get your ProBlend 600? Your wicks, jars, FO, die from. So ProBlend 600 specifically, if you're buying it from a distributor, it's just going to be the flaming candle. Um, Maker's Blend 100 is, is uh, Midwest Fragrance and then Joy Wax is Nature's Garden. Yep. Same wax. Yep. Um, and then as far as wicks, I exclusively use Premier Wix uh, 700 series. Um, and that's just based off of, you know, I've, I've tested HTP, I've tested, you know, Eco. If you look at the, uh, you know, the different websites, they tell you different things, yeah. but Premier has been the one for me. Yeah, most suppliers are gonna recommend, first of all, they're gonna start with recommending a wick that they carry. So yeah. if someone doesn't carry a Premier 700 wick, they're not gonna recommend that. They're gonna recommend Eco or HTP or whatever. And let me, let me add in first, I guess, by saying this wax works with a lot of wicks it can work with a lot of wicks yeah. i agree with matt for 10 plus years now i've been using the premier 700 wicks overall consistently they just work the best for me they also are aesthetically pleasing they look nice i i prefer the look of those versus those kind of uh threaded looking and paper core ones i just think they look better in the candle yeah. which is kind of a it's not an important part <laughs> but um they also come in so many sizes um, and uh, you can get them from a few different places. Um, you can get them from Flaming Candle if you're getting your wax there. Um, Aztec carries them, and then I started carrying them in January, mostly because I use them for so long, and I think a lot of people in this group already already order them from me. My, my website, Black Tie Barn, Flaming Candle, and Aztec are the three that 
There's others. There are others. There are but others. Hive and Honey may sell them, maybe. As far as Black Tie Barn, I'm not going to, you know, we're, this isn't what we're doing as far as promoting that. But if you want every size, that's where I, yeah. that's where I can find it. Um, yeah, I do, I do have every size and sample packs. And again, we're not trying to promote it whatsoever, but uh, I've been using these wicks forever. So. If, if you go to Flaming Kitten, like my, my point is, I didn't know that there was a 730. Oh, because nice. you know, Flaming Candle had 725, yep. 735, 745. So you can really tweak it by you know finding a place that has all of the in between. So if you don't have Premier Wicks and you're not interested in Premier Wicks, try with something you already have. So I don't want it, I didn't want anyone to think that like, oh no, I want I have to run out now and get Premier 700 Wicks. Yep. Try what you've got, but if you're not getting the results you want, I would look at Premier first. How long do you typically wait before test burn with ProBlend 600 using a nine ounce straight sided jar? Which I, for me, it's one to two days. I mean, it, I can pretty much get, if I'm wick testing, I'm good with that. If I'm freight, you know, if I'm testing for hot throw, uh, I'll let it wait five days to, you know, when I'm ready for a final candle, put it in a room by itself. I want to smell the hot throw five days. Yeah. I don't know that there's a right answer on this. Everyone's going to have a little different practice here. It, I, it, how sensitive is your sniffer too? Right. I mean, some people smell stuff very strong that uh, there's no reason for them to wait a week or something like that. Um, this wax does not need a super long cure time like a soy wax would, 100% uh, soy wax. Um, my own practice personally is I, I, I usually give it like three days, but that's not, it's not because three is inherently better than two and worse than four. It's yeah. just a process. I make test candles and then I just know usually three days later is when I'm gonna start testing them. One thing that I do talk about on the channel a lot is don't use that one test as like the only test you ever do and feel confident with it. Before we sat down, we we're actually in the lobby. Matt and I were just talking about how we've tested candles months later and performed differently. Now there's several reasons for that. It's usually the fragrance oil. That's the culprit. Yeah. But I have a video on this channel called the, the rule of two. And basically what I like to do is test over after two or three days. And then I will pull either that same candle if I didn't test it all the way through, which on the first one I usually do. Yep. Um, and then I'll pull it from the batch and test again after two weeks. And then I'll do it again after two months. And that's just to make sure I've got consistent results. And if, if it's past all of that, then I stop worrying about that candle. Like I'm, I'm just, uh, at that point, I consider that a three check mark win. Yep. But everyone's going to have their own testing process on this. Um, that brings us right into the next question. We, we talked about this uh, earlier is first two, th two or three burns, the wick is good. As it burns down, the wick gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And we talked about specifically Christmas hearth. Yeah, that's a good example. Yeah. Yeah. If you guys are familiar with Christmas hearth from Candle Science, awesome fragrance, by the way. Um, I, I can tell you from my personal experience, the ones that I noticed this happen most with are uh, cinnamon based scents um, or, or scents that are similar to that. Um, ones that just have a tendency to char a little bit as they burn or don't necessarily play whack, uh, play well with heat. And so what, what Matt was just alluding to and he can expand on as well is we both had candles that after the first burn seemed great, second burn seemed great, you get halfway down the jar and all of a sudden it's just a tiny flame and no melt pool, no heat just doesn't want to survive. The wick doesn't seem to want to be able to, to, to do it. It's almost always a fragrance oil problem. Um, and when we say problem, it doesn't mean there's something wrong with the oil, but it's, it's, it's the cause of why that wick's not working in that specific application. Um, the first thing I would try is if you see that happen is to wick up, mm -hmm. which most of the time will solve the problem. It solved our problem with Christmas hearth, for example, but I've also tested candles with a fragrance oil that never worked, no matter how large I went. And then you got two options. Well, you technically got three. One, it's a if that if that oil's being that troublesome, I would just tend to move on and find a different yeah. one. It's not worth it. There's too many out there. It's not worth the time and, and money. Um, but if you really dead set on using it, you could try wicking up, as we talked about, or you can also try a different wick type, one that can handle really robust viscosity, like a square braid wick, some CD wicks, but you, you risk introducing other things that aren't as good, like the reasons you didn't go with that wick in the first place. So. Right, right. Yeah, I agree. Um, for me, it's, it's, I could wick up one time beyond what I was using and it, and it solved the problem. So yeah. if you see that, if that starts to be the issue, it is a fragrance oil because I can do the same thing on several different candles, 
fragrance oils and don't and not have that issue. And then this is a good question as far as if you're starting with this wax, what percentage do you test with and what percentage is most common? You, you want to start? You can... I, I can start it. Um, so I always start my testing at 9% because it kind of gives me I a place. I the same answer. Yeah. It kind of, I can go up or down from there. And when I say go up, I'm not sure I'd go to nine or 10. It may be nine and a half. Like I'm, I'm tweaking it at that point, but I start at nine, but I do have some, you know, thicker fragrance oils that I've got to drop to eight. I've even got one that's seven and a half percent. Otherwise the wick's not going to perform right. But once I do that, and you'll notice it when you're, you're testing and you're getting, you know, larger mushrooms, it's not necessarily that it's the wick that's the wrong size. It's, it's how much fragrance oil you have in it. And it's just not burning. It. Especially if it's tough to burn fragrance oil. Yeah. yeah. Um, most fragrance oils, you probably won't notice a difference on how it gets wicked in, in mushrooms and stuff, whether you're at seven, eight or nine, but the ones that are kind of troublesome and picky, you'll certainly notice it. Yeah. Um, my answer is the same. I start with 9%. Now I, in some videos for testing a new scent for a supplier, like I'm testing candle science scents or something yeah. like that. A lot of times I'll do 10 for two reasons. It's just much easier, much quicker math for me to make some sample testers. And I'm just trying to test in some of those videos the, the scent itself. I'm not really trying to wick test. Um, but for actually testing my own products, I start at 9% as well. In my personal experience, you will get different answers. Again, it, this is very, the hardest question to answer is anything related to scent throw because it's so subjective. Yeah. And I might think something smells strong, Matt might barely smell it, vice versa. I might think something smells good, he might hate it, and vice versa. It uh, happens all the time. But I don't notice much of a difference, if any, between nine and nine and a half percent, for example, yeah. or nine and 10%. What I do notice is that it costs more to make and it, they didn't see any benefit. Right. <laughs> so exactly. uh, I, have, I start with nine and I have way more situations where I go lower than I do where I go higher. There are some soft scents that I've tried going up a little bit and it just, I don't know that it even made a difference. So some more cotton scents. Or yeah. People. The, the, the manufacturer of this wax as well, the suppliers will tell you it can hold up to 10%. Um, mostly I think is what they say. 99% and I don't even think that's high 95% um, of especially the larger companies using that wax are not using 10%. So yeah. they're yeah. most are starting around eight or nine. That, and I'll just throw this out there because I saw it in another uh, question uh, that we can answer real quick. Would you add anything to it? Would you add Viabar? Oh, that's a, okay. So that's a really good question. And um, that is a, that honestly requires another video probably to go. We could have a whole conversation on that. Um, and the truth is, is it, for me to even tell you hundred percent, I would need to do a heck of a lot more testing myself. So I'll give you my initial thoughts, but before I do, let me just remind that if anyone wants to try that, don't base it off what I say or Matt says or anyone else says, that is something you need to test and experiment for yourself um, because I've even had inconsistent results. So if you're not familiar with Vibar, Vibar is a, uh, an additive that its sole purpose really is to be a, um, it, it helps bind materials to the wax, fragrance oil, even color. Um, and it is a hardener a little bit. So it's used in like a lot of pillar blends, uh, wax melts. Um, and so it has sometimes, or at least people claim it has a secondary benefit of allow of increasing hot throw. The real answer to that is Vibar doesn't increase hot throw. It doesn't, it doesn't help. It doesn't make fragrance stronger. What it does do is allow you to add more to your to your wax because it's a binding agent. So if you have a wax that only holds 10% and you add Vibar to it, you might be able to get it to hold 10.5%. And where Vibar was originally used was in paraffin waxes, straight, uh, straight paraffin waxes, like modeling paraffin waxes. They can only hold like 3% yep. normally on their own. They have Vibar added to them, which allows them to hold 6%, for example. Yep. So that's what it does. It increases capacity, which, often leads to better scent throw because people are adding more fragrance, but it's not the, it's not Vibar itself isn't causing better scent throw. Um, so although some people claim it does, and I, I, I don't know. All right. So, um, I personally have added it and, and tested it, but I, I wasn't getting enough noticeable results to, to add it to mine permanently. It can, it can make your candles a little more vibrant. If you're using color, if you're, if you're using a really tough oil, that is super heavy and, and even at lower percentages, it seems to be seeping out. That's one I would mm -hmm. test 
five bar on to see if it helped. But uh, again, I think as a new candle maker, you want to keep things as simple as possible. And if you're finding t you're having to do all these like tips and tricks to get something to work properly, I would just change oils <laughs> again. It's yeah. the easiest solution. Yeah. And like you were saying, if you're just starting using this wax, I, I wouldn't even mess around with Vibar. You're going to have to do more testing. The candle itself is going to cost you more because you're trying to add more fragrance oil into it. And Vibar. And, and Vibar. Vibar's not cheap. Right. So um, if, you're, if you're experienced and you want to try it on a couple of different scents, yeah. maybe. But uh, otherwise, I wouldn't even worry about it with this wax. Uh, with that being said, if anyone is watching and wants to try it, there's three Vibar types you're going to run into. Uh, you need to choose the right one, which would be Vibar 260 for this wax. It's simply about melt point of the Vibar. So there's three kinds. 260 is the one you're looking for. Yep. Um, we have a question. Well, Barbara, Barbara asked us about our um, documenting testing. Now, this could be for any candle. It's not specific to, to wax or to this wax. Um, but how do you document? I've seen in your videos, you have labels on different candles, that type of thing. But what are you doing behind the scenes to document? So uh, another really good question. Um, I, I'm doing several things mm -hmm. and that's been the inherent problem. So I think I've mentioned to you, um, I actually am planning on put, creating some uh, tools, I guess is one way to say it for everyone to help um, both a digital one and a physical like testing log type thing to help people do this better and track it better. But for the most part, um, if I'm doing just simple one-off testing, like I'm testing a bunch of new oils and I'm not testing a, like making a ton of candles, I'll just put something on the jar itself, yeah. like a testing label um, or even, even just a permanent marker. Sometimes you can just, depending on the jar you're using, uh, you can test it that way. Um, something else I've done in the past, which I really did like, was like asset stickers. They had numbers on them, with barcode or something. Put those on your jars, and then that number, that asset sticker number, like a four-digit number, get yourself a log and write that number, and then everything about it. And the benefit of that is you've got a log that has all the information, but the only thing you got to worry about on a candle is just that, that one sticker, that one number. Mm -hmm. And no matter where you move it to, there's no other labels to worry about. You don't have to remember anything at all. Just go back to your logbook, find that number, and... If you change wick, make a note of that. Here's my, you know, it's just, it's one way of doing it. You don't have to use a number. You can just, you can name the candle, whatever you want to do. The other thing, the other place I do it in is, is wherever I'm making my, keeping my recipe. So I also do it in Crafty Base, which uh, I will make a test product. And then in the notes of that, um, I will put in, it, it tracks the recipe. So I'll put whatever I made the product with. And in the yeah. notes section, I keep track of um, the wicks that I'm trying and all of that and any right. feedback or not feedback, but observations. Mm -hmm. So, so similar thing. I do, I do label the uh, jar, and but I use Crafty Base pretty exclusively. Mm -hmm. Just just it it just helps me keep track of what I've done. It also you know takes care of what I've used. Yeah. Um, so it it to me it's the easiest way to keep track of everything. So I use Crafty Base place. for it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And if if you're new to that, there um, it's linked in every video. I'll have it below. I've done overview videos. If you've never seen one before. Um, Matt uses it. I use it. You can ask us questions about it. Um, but, uh, yeah, if you're, if you're already going to have one place that's tracking all your materials and your recipes, it makes sense to track your testing there as well. And there's so many ways you can use it. Like you can, a lot of ways you can do it in there. Yeah. We're probably not doing it the same, but there's lots of ways to do it. Yeah. All right. Next question is all about soot. Uh, what is the best way to deal with soot? Cause sometimes you're going to get soot. So how, what are your feelings on that? Well, my feelings on soot in general is that most people freak out about it too much. Um, anything that burns can soot for the most part. Um, and a little bit is perfectly normal and unavoidable. It can be caused by environmental conditions. It could be, you could have it around a fan or a, you get some kind of draft. Certain fragrances can cause it more. Certain wick types can do it more. Long story short, if it's minimal soot and you're just getting a little bit here and there, yeah. every once in a while it flaps off, or you're getting a little bit around the edge, it's normal, would not worry about it at all. Now, that being said, I think this wax is actually much better. I would say this one falls in the middle. Yeah. Middle ranges as far as waxes and soot. Certain waxes are brutal about it. Like, I like 6006. It's a good, solid, high-performing wax. That one soots way worse than yeah. this does. Way yeah. worse. Um, a lot of people think soy waxes don't soot. They do. You just don't see it. It's, a <laughs> it's a white and gray. Yeah. Um, and still, you even get black soot on those two. Um, a lot of things contribute to soot. Fragrance, wick type, all sorts of stuff. So... Suggestion one, don't worry about it as much. If you're getting excessive and it's flapping constantly, um, change something. 
probably your wick first and then look at the fragrance oil. As far as controlling it and trying to make it better, proper wicking and wick sizing is the number one thing that's gonna do it. Yep. And where you're gonna see most people have, um, and jump in anytime you want, because you're mm -hmm. probably thinking the same thing, but where most people see issues with soot is on jars where they're using one wick, but it's a large wick. So it's like a wider, kind of a wider jar and they're having to use a really large size wick to try to do that. It's just, it's a really tough job that wick's trying to perform for that much wax and that size of a jar all by itself. Yeah. And that's when you start tinkering with, is this the time to start trying two wicks instead, two small wicks instead. Two small wicks is gonna be considerably better at wick, soot control and fragrance throw. Fragrance throw, yeah. Um, than sure. one wick trying to do the same job. The problem is, is there's a certain range size of jar where it's too small to do two wicks, but almost too big to get good optimal burn with one wick. It's the it, the Libby Tumbler, three yeah. point, the 3.25 3. inch yeah, or whatever, 5, 5, 5. is the worst size to, to wick with any wax for the most part, but especially yeah. a tougher burning wax. So um, that's my general thought on it. Yeah, same thing. And the other issue could be where the candle is burning. I mean, if you're in a room that has a ceiling fan going, even at a slower speed, you could have, you know, it could start flickering and you could start getting some soot. But typically, if that's not the case, you've got the wrong wick if you're getting too much. Yep. Um, also, the temperature of the room. No one thinks about this as far as soot, but the colder your room is, the, the colder and harder the wax is, which makes the job of the wick harder to burn. So if the wick is struggling more to get a good, easy burn, it's gonna flap more, it's gonna bounce more, you'll get more soot because it's, it's, it's not a very efficient burn. Or if you're burning in a really warm environment, the wax is already soft. Yep. It makes the wick's job so much easier. Yep. So you'll have a lot less problems. Yep. So that's why we say sometimes don't worry about it. You can't control it. You might test burn a candle at home and get perfect results. You send it to a customer and they're like, well, this one isn't performing great different environments. Do the best you can. <laughs> yeah, if you're seeing some at the top and you see, you know, a little bit, expect that. But if, if the, the top of the jar is black, it's the wrong wick. Yeah. And especially as the candle burns down further, obviously, because yeah. more is gonna get caught on the walls. That's normal. It's, um, it's not gonna just escape perfectly out of the center. Like you said, if you're picking up a jar and it's completely black, just all over, that's a problem. That's a problem. All right, the next question is about yellowing candles. Um, from the UV, UV light. Now I know you use UV inhibitor. I use the same thing. Um, now I, I've also switched or mostly use an amber jar, so I don't have to worry about it as much. Yeah. Um, but I, I still make, you know, some mason jar candles and stuff like that. So I do have to use a UV inhibitor. You'll get a lot of different answers. And I don't even know if necessarily Matt and I'll give you the same answer on this one. I used to use UV inhibitor more than I do now. And the only reason I say that is um, I have, products that are turning over much faster now, inventory. Yeah. If you're making candles and they're selling and getting used quickly, it's, there's really no purpose in it. UV inhibitor is to help delay, it, keep your candles looking, uh, keep your colors looking um, the original bright, vibrant color longer if they're exposed to sunlight. If they are constantly being stored in a dark closet or as soon as you make them, they're selling a week later and getting used, you're really not getting any benefit out of it. And if you don't dye your candles, you don't have to worry about it at all, right. in my opinion. But if you do color your candles and, and you want to use UV inhibitor, here, this is it's kind of sound like strange advice, but if you're going to use UV inhibitor, use it all the time, mm -hmm. even in products that don't need it. So even if you have certain fragrances that have no color, you don't want to have to change your recipe again later. Right. So if you're going to use UV inhibitor, I talk about this in one of my videos, just use it all the time. Make it part of your recipe. If you don't want to use even inhibitor, then don't use it. Now, there's exceptions to that, obviously. Uh, maybe you only normally make non-colored candles, but for a certain wholesale customer right. or private label customer, you make them something specific, then go with whatever makes sense. But as a general rule, keep your life simple. Don't have too many different processes. If you're going to use it, use it all the time. If you're not going to use it, don't use it. A couple things of clarification too. Uh, UV inhibitor is meant to protect your colors from exposure uh, to UV light, like sunlight and certain lights. It's not going to have any or very minimal impact on things that are caused by vanillin and other fragrance oil notes, because those aren't, that's not UV. UV inhibitor is, is not meant to do that. In fact, I'm headed to the candle conference, candle, 
National Candle Association conference here in a couple of days. That's actually where I'm headed in Charleston. And this will be a whole seminar. This will be a whole topic conversation. You got more thoughts on UV inhibitor. It is optional. Even if you color your candles, it's optional. But uh, if, you, if you're dyeing your candles, I would recommend it. Yeah. The other thing though, real quick, everywhere you get it, it's gonna call it UV inhibitor, but they're different. Some places it's not the same thing. And some of it, it's noticeable. So I'm trying to think of two. So flaming candle and I think it I think I want to say Aztecs is very different. Aztecs is like sandy and grainy. Yeah. It's a different it's like fragrance oils. They're all similar, but they're made some of them are made from different manufacturers. And so uh whichever one you're gonna use and test with, always use that one. Always yeah. use that one. Yeah. yeah. If you can. So I want to go back to I uh, this is from the beginner. The beginner person, we have a question about what jar would you start with? What wick would you start with? And I can go back to when I, I first started making candles. I started with 6006. And I, I love the hot throw, but it is a tough wax to start with as far as wicking when you're first starting out. So if you were to say, um, very first time I've ever made a candle, what jar with this wax and what wick would you have them start with? Honestly, I can't think of a better wax mm -hmm. for a beginner than the three we're talking about today, which at least for ones, it's going to give you good overall around performance yeah. and also easy to use. I, 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 don't, I can't think of a better one I'd recommend right now. Jar, for simplicity, I would either probably say the nine ounce straight sided jar, to be honest, um, or like the, the short square mason jars. Yeah. One of those two. I, a lot of people like to start with the jelly jars, which is not too different than the nine ounce jar. But it's too too narrow for me. It's a little too too narrow. Yeah, I agree. I'm uh, not a big fan of it. Looks I like, also don't like the way they look. Right. That's just personal. Looks like uh, I don't know. Somebody made a bunch of candles in their living room, and now they're selling them at the flea market. Yeah, it, it looks like you're buying jam. I yeah, mean, it's exactly. what it looks like to me. And so there is a place for it, especially if that's your your branding a niche. Yeah. Um, then it totally makes sense. But um, I, I actually think those are trickier to wick than the nine ounce straight sided jar is. Yeah. Anyways, they're too too small. So I would say nine ounce straight sided jar or um, the, the square square mason jar, preferably the smaller one, not the tall one. The tall one can get tricky. Ones I would avoid if you're new are tens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they're much tougher to wick yeah. and they're just, they're, they're different. Um, and then while we like double wicked candles and larger jars, I would avoid that at first. Yeah. Um, keep it simple. So, um, so stay under the three inch inside diameter. Yes, the straight sided jar is like what, 2.8? Yeah. 2.83, something like that. Yeah. Um, that's a good size jar. We are both very familiar with it. So I, that's another pro. If you're a new maker and, and you're looking to start with these materials, um, other plenty of other people have experience with them and both Matt and I do. Yeah. So we can offer a lot more help that way. So that would be the wax, that would be the jar. What else was on your list? Wick. Premier 700 would be the be uh, what I would recommend starting with. So if you're with. using the seven or the, the nine inch, nine oh. inch straight sided, what's your range there? Uh, okay, so the range that I would test would be 725 up to 745. But I think you're gonna find 80%, if not higher, probably being a 735, yep. for example. And then you can make tweaks and adjustments from there. But that's the majority that I use in there. It's the majority that Matt uses, I believe. And then there's certain times we've been able to go up or needed or needed to go up or been able to go down on a few. That's the range I would start with. And um, there might be more on your list, but this kind of made me just think this might be a good time to mention this idea. I've been kicking around the idea of building some kits for brand new yep. candle makers with waxes and materials that I think are really good starting points and ones that we're familiar with and ones that we know that just work um, and give people a better head start. Yeah. And so if anyone watching this is interested in that, let me know. Um, I've been kicking around the idea and I have no idea when, when I'd get to it, but if there's enough interest in it, I'll make it a priority. Well, I, you know, like I said, I started out in 6006 just because the first video, one of the first videos I watched you made, uh, I think it was the Blue, Blue Spruce. Spruce. Yep. Four candles. Um, but had I had I known about this four or five months earlier, once I once I discovered yeah. this wax, I'm like, so if you, oh. you would have watched my next video right, right. first, yeah, because I I think most of the videos I've done since that point have been a lot of six thousand or six prevalent six hundred videos. Yeah, um, yeah, six thousand six is a great wax. It's just tougher. I would say don't you know it's it's more of an inter intermediate wax. I would yeah. say, yeah, for sure. But once I discovered ProBlend 600 and, and uh, started using it, I'm like, oh my gosh, yeah. if I would have started with this, I could have really advanced yeah. faster. 
I agree. And, and look, I want to be totally transparent about something too. You know, there's certain people that say that they've, they've tried this wax and they weren't getting very good hot throw. And if you go to one of these suppliers' websites, you'll see mostly good reviews and the occasional people that say, I didn't get good hot throw. There's so many things that can lead to that. So don't let that deter you. You're never going to find a wax that's 100% perfect all the time. Um, it could be the fragrance they're using. It could be um, maybe they just have a hard time detecting scent. It could be where they're burning it. If you're trying to burn a small candle in a large open space, that could be it. There's so many reasons. Yeah. Also, we were talking about this before we recorded this. Not every fragrance is going to be a strong fragrance. Uh, and not every fragrance can be a strong fragrance in every wax. So if that happens, don't. My advice is not to try to recreate the wheel and say, all right, I need to do all new wick testing. I need to hold, find a whole new wax and start over. Yeah. No, because you're going to just constantly, it's a zero sum game. And you're constantly going to be chasing your tail doing that because you're never going to be 100% happy. Yeah. If you have a fragrance that is not strong and you don't like it, just ditch it and move yeah. on. Yeah. How many have you just said, all right, I'm just scratching it off my list. It's not one I'm going to keep. The shelves up so there. do I. So it's normal. It doesn't mean you're doing something wrong. It just means that this one isn't isn't going to cut it. Right. This doesn't pass our test and move yeah. on. You There are hundreds of thousands of fragrance oils to choose from. Don't change everything because you're struggling with a handful of them. Yeah. My, my advice. Yeah. And if it's one that you really like and you want to use because you like the scent, just find something similar. Yep. That's uh, where Facebook groups yeah. or anywhere else can come in handy. Tell everyone, I like the scent, but I'd like to try a different version of it, or anyone can recommend something similar to this. You'll get tons of suggestions, tons of them. I think that's all the questions on my end. Do you, can you think uh, of anything that you want to use to button up? Just um, Not really. I mean, most of those questions covered, I think, stuff that I would have just by default thought of talking about. You know, we didn't really, this isn't necessarily a question, but I think it's worth mentioning. The cost of this, this wax is good too. Yeah. Um, as far as the price of waxes go, it's on the lower end compared to most. Yeah. So not only you're looking for beginner friendly in terms of usability, it's also beginner friendly as far as affordability. <laughs> right. And that's really important for new candle makers. Um, it is more expensive than it was a year ago. It definitely was more than two years ago, but that's across the board with everything. So once again, if you're looking for a good place to start, this is a, a good wax. There are plenty of good ones out there. We're not trying to say that others aren't good. I can't, I mean, how many, the number of waxes I use on a regular basis and are testing and trying, on a number on a uh, on a constant basis is is kind of crazy, but every time someone asks me, I'm stuck. I'm brand new, or I'm stuck. Like, wh what should I do? I just tend to come back to these yeah. ones and say, well, let's start with this, go back to the beginning, yeah. keep it simple. Well, this has been fun. I've enjoyed it. Thank you all for sending in your questions. Um, yeah. They're on Matt's group, and if there's any we didn't get to, or you just didn't get a chance to ask. Uh, we can, I, I'm not going to drive back to Pensacola every time to do one, <laughs> but uh, we can do, we can do some yeah. Zoom remote ones as well. well actually, we were going to do that originally. And then I told Matt I was headed down this direction. So it's like, yeah, let's just wait till I get there. It'd be more fun. So if you think of any more, let us know. We can also follow up. You don't have to wait to the next video. You can ask questions and we'll follow up there. I'm, I'm in the group too, by the way, if you yeah. didn't know that. So, um, and if, if you're on, watching on my channel and not familiar with the group or who Matt is, I'll leave that information. So if you want to check out their group, you can. Awesome. But uh, well, thanks, Wade. That was yeah. awesome. No, this is a lot of fun. We'll do this again soon.